Well, thank you, Mr. Zimkoviak, and thanks to all of you for being here today. I know some of you I had the chance to meet back in April when I was here, and my kids who have to endure listening to many and many different of my talks said, Dad, don't bore them to death with the same story. So I'm going to try to mix it up and keep it a little bit more engaging today for you. Um, it is an honor to be here at the premier Culture of Life High School campus, and the very fact that I live just a few minutes away from St. Michael the Archangel High School is a real blessing. There's a very good chance that our daughter Claire and our son Patrick will be coming here themselves, and so I just want to thank all of you because you are really charting the course for what it means to be a pro-life high school campus. Now, I have to tell you that for many of us, being pro-life, it, it means something but sometimes there are events in our life that really shape what that means to us. Because when we think about topics like abortion, stem cell research, euthanasia, I mean, these are just topics. And yes, we can get kind of educated on these topics, but sometimes we have to be awakened to the reality of what these things actually mean. And as I was praying today about what to share with you during this time together, I really felt that I needed to share an experience that I had several years back that really radically transformed my perspective on these topics of life, specifically the topic of abortion. Because for my early life, I was what I would call passively pro-life. I didn't like abortion, but I really didn't want to do anything about it. But I met this wonderful young lady, many of you who have met her, my beautiful wife, Margaret. We've now been married 18 years. She is my best friend and the mother of our children. And uh, when Margaret was growing up, she was raised in a Catholic family down in Corpus Christi, Texas. And her parents used to take her every weekend to go out and pray outside of local abortion facilities. Now, when she did this, they went week after week, rain or shine, heat or cold, it didn't matter because they believed maybe it would make a difference. And over a period of several years, they saw every single standalone abortion facility in Corpus Christi, Texas, go out of business and close. It was amazing. But my upbringing, I was raised in a Protestant home. I went to a little Protestant church. The topic of abortion never came up in my life. And in fact, it was never mentioned in my home. And so it wasn't until I moved to Texas, was suddenly immersed there in the Bible Belt and met Margaret and started to hear her stories that abortion suddenly showed up on my radar. And that was when I became passively pro-life. But one event that really began to propel me forward in getting active instead of passive on the topic of abortion was when Planned Parenthood opened a local abortion facility in that town where we lived of College Station, Texas. And it was the first ever abortion facility in the history of that community that had for years not had an abortion center. And our community really was in an uproar and people got together saying, what can we do about this? So we got active and we started doing things and we started mobilizing the community. But still for me, it was kind of this, it was an issue, it was something that I started to recognize was important, but it still wasn't this burning passion like it really needed to be. So in the fall of 2004, we had an experience I'll share a little bit more about in a few minutes, where we did the first ever 40 Days for Life in that community of Bryan College Station, Texas. And during that time, we had people praying and fasting for an end to abortion. We had 24 hour a day, 40 day long prayer vigils going on outside of the abortion facility. And we also had a team of college students going door to door to every household in our town, inviting people to be a part of the solution to the crisis of abortion in our community. In the midst of that time, suffice it to say, we were extremely busy. We were exhausted with all the things we were doing. I had many nights where at two or three in the morning, I would be out with a group of high school students or college students out at the vigil outside of the abortion facility. And so there was very few times during that campaign where I was actually able to leave our community and go give a talk somewhere else. And only one time that I went to go speak at a large event out of town was in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And so I was really crazy getting ready and I didn't have much time to think about it. And I jumped on the plane and I flew and I landed in Grand Rapids in the early afternoon. What I didn't know was I was about to have an experience that was going to radically transform my perspective on this issue of abortion. The guy who picked me up at the airport was named Jim Sprague. And Jim is a young man. He runs a pregnancy help center there in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And when Jim picked me up at the airport, he said, well, David, it's still early afternoon. You don't speak until tonight at the banquet. So we've got two options of what we can do right now. Well, option one is I could just take you to the hotel and you can get rested up and get dressed and ready and just take your time getting ready for tonight. Or I can take you and show you something that I think will profoundly impact your life. 
Now, I really at that point said, that's not even an option. Go to the hotel and rest or something that will impact my life. Okay, I'll take option two. So Jim said, okay. So he drove me down into downtown Grand Rapids. And as we drove, there's a lot of one-way streets. And we were going between all the tall buildings. And finally, we turned onto the street where we were headed to. And the street was called Ransom Street. And we finally pulled up in front of our destination. And it was a building, number 72 Ransom Street. Now, 72 Ransom Street was an old church-looking building. And as we parked there in front of it, Jim said to me, he turned and he said, David, we're going to walk in there. The people who occupy this building are going to tell you the history of 72 Ransom Street. But brace yourself, this might be pretty emotionally overwhelming. I had no idea what I was going into. So we got out of his car, we walked up the couple of steps, and we opened the giant wooden doors of this old church building, 72 Ransom Street, and we walked inside where we were greeted by the people who occupied that building. And right there, they proceeded to tell me the history of 72 Ransom Street. This building had been built in the late 1880s, originally to serve as a Jewish synagogue. And for years, it was a place that worshipped God. This congregation came together, they prayed together, they worshipped God together, and it was a place of life, of love, a place that honored God Almighty. But over time, that Jewish congregation kept on growing and growing, and eventually they outgrew that facility and decided they need to move out of the downtown area and build a new synagogue for themselves. So they recognized they needed to sell 72 Ransom Street. So they put it on the market, and then a Greek Orthodox church said, well, we'll buy it. And they were smaller, so they bought 72 Ransom Street. And again, it continued to serve as a house of worship to God. So people came there, there were weddings performed in that building, there were funerals performed in that building, and it was a place continually of life, of love. But over time, that Greek Orthodox congregation began to dwindle, and they recognized this was too big a facility for them, and so they determined it was time to sell 72 Ransom Street. Well, in 1996, some business people saw it on the market and said, well, you know what, nobody's buying it as a church, why don't we buy it and turn it into a money-making opportunity? So they bought 72 Ransom Street and decided to rent it out to the highest possible bidder. And the highest bidder was a notorious Western Michigan abortionist. And this abortionist decided to turn 72 Ransom Street, a building that had for over 100 years served as a place of worship to God, and they turned it into the largest Western Michigan abortion facility. During the time that abortionist occupied that building, they know that more than 20,000 abortions were performed there. More than 20,000 children perished. More than 20,000 women were wounded inside of 72 Ransom Street. They know that because they found all the records that had not been properly kept and had not been properly destroyed when the abortionist had moved out of the building. But they told me that starting in 1996, the Christians of Grand Rapids and Western Michigan began to be really troubled by what this former church had become a place of life that had been transformed into a place of death and despair. And so beginning in 1998, a group of Christians came together and they started to pray every single week that God would reclaim 72 Ransom Street and once again use it as a place of worship or a place that would glorify God rather than spit in the face by destroying the lives of children made in His image and likeness. 1998, they started praying. And in 1999, they thought their prayers had been answered when they saw a listing that the building, 72 Ransom Street, was for sale. So they went in and started making offers, trying to buy this building. And the owners of the facility just didn't want to rent it to these Christians. And so year after year after year, they ran into brick wall after brick wall after brick wall. Nothing was working. They were not able to get this building, and the abortions continued to go up and up. But finally, they had a breakthrough in 2004, literally five years after they'd started making offers. They finally threw out a ridiculously high offer. The owners finally bit, and they said, great, we'll sell you the building. And so this group of business people bought the building, and the very first thing they did was they threw the abortionist out of the building, threw him out of business, and then immediately deeded over this building to a ministry called Life International. Life International is an organization that goes and plants pregnancy centers anywhere in the world where abortion rears its ugly head. They go in and they plant pregnancy centers there to help women in a time of need. They deeded the building over to Life International. And in fact, the people who greeted me at the doorway were those from Life International who occupied the building. What they told me is that five days before I was there, 
the last abortions were performed in that building. And they said, we need to take you on a tour to show you what was happening in this place. Literally five days before I got there, children were perishing in that exact same building. So we're standing in the entryway and they explained to me as I saw stairs going up and stairs going down that when young women came into the abortion facility, the first thing they would do is if there was anybody with them, a boyfriend, a husband, a parent, they would immediately separate the girl away from her support person because they knew that person might talk her out of the abortion and that would then mean they'd lose $500, $800, $1,200 depending on how far along the baby was in her womb. So they would immediately send the support person upstairs away from the girl, send the girl downstairs, and they would put her into a waiting room waiting for her abortion. In that waiting room, I saw they had beautiful chairs and wall hangings. It was a very nice room. That's where they would be sitting there with other women, some of them crying and some of them just really struggling with what was going on. And they would be waiting for there for their abortion. What those women didn't know was what was on the wall right behind where they were sitting in those chairs. They showed me the room right next door, and in that room, years earlier, the ceiling of the building had, inside had collapsed due to water damage, and there was rot and mildew. The stench just poured out when they opened the door, and I saw cockroaches scatter every which way. They didn't even know as they were waiting for their so-called safe abortions that literally less than a foot away from them, there were cockroaches infesting a room. Then they would take the girls out of the waiting room into the procedure room, two rooms down, and they took me into that room. Now, when the abortionist had been kicked out, he took out all of his surgical equipment. But you could still see on the floor there where the surgical table from the abortions had been because there was a dried rectangle of caked up blood and rust from the unsanitary conditions in this facility. On the wall where the suction machine had been, it had been ripped out and there was mildew and mold that was on the wall there. There were still a few surgical tools on the counter that hadn't been sterilized in months this was the place where these women were going in for their so-called safe abortions. But the thing that troubled me the most, I looked at the floor, and it was kind of a linoleum-type floor, and in one spot there was this kind of arch of just kind of worn down. It was almost white, and you could see that something had happened there. And I said, what, what was that right there? They said, that is where the abortionist stood and moved back and forth while ripping the tiny limbs off of these babies while doing the abortions, more than 20,000 of them. Literally five days before I was there, that had been happening in that room. They then took me to the next room, which is where they would take the young women after their abortions. And in that room, they had already gotten their money. They had already gotten everything they wanted from these girls. And they dumped them into a room with moth-eaten couches. It was a room with stains all over the carpet. They would just give them a glass of juice and a cookie before sending them out onto the streets to fend for themselves. As I walk through this facility, I have to tell you, all of a sudden, this issue of abortion came alive to me. And I recognized as I stood in those rooms and as I looked at the aftermath of what had been a horrible loss of life and a wounding of so many women, I realized that this wasn't just an issue. This wasn't just one of the many important things we could be concerned about. This literally, what we are dealing with, the struggle between life and death, is the epic struggle of our generation. This is the battle between good and evil, between darkness and light, literally between heaven and hell. But then they told me the story of the first day when they occupied the building, just a few days before I was there. And that was when it all came together for me. Because the first day they took ownership of this building that had just the day before been performing abortions, they called everybody they knew in town, pastors, priests, uh, religious, people who were involved with pregnancy centers and pro-life ministries, and they said, we need to all come together. We need to pray over this facility as we reclaim it. And so a whole bunch of people gathered in the entryway of 72 Ransom Street that morning. And as they gathered, they said, where do we need to go to start praying? And somebody said, well, we should start praying wherever the abortionist began every single day his deadly business. So they went down the long hall, down in the basement to the very back, where there was a door that opened out into the alley. And that door was a big, heavy metal door that swung open out into the alley because the abortionist, every day when he was there, would park his car right outside, come through that door, and begin his work. The door was closed and latched and they gathered right inside that door and they all held hands and they began to pray fervently for God to cleanse this place from all that had happened there. When they reached the end of that time of prayer there, one of the pastors said the final amen of that prayer. And all of a sudden that big heavy metal door on its own burst open, swung out into the alleyway and clanged against the, the brickwork outside and they felt a rush of wind going out of that facility. A few seconds later they felt a gentle breeze come back in. 
Now they stood there and they were quite stunned by what they had just experienced. And silently, not knowing what to say or do, they all went back up into the entryway and were just standing there kind of dumbfounded, thinking, what, what did we just see there? And then a woman came in off the street. She opened the door and she came in and said, hey, I, I just wanted to ask you, what happened to that statue? And they said, what, what statue? She said, well, I live right near here. I walk by here every day. And for years, there's been on the roof of the building that statue of that, that demon figure perched over the building. It's gone today. It's been there for years. What happened to it? There had never been a statue of a demon on the roof of that building. But as they looked into the eyes of that woman, they could tell she had previously seen something that was not there that day. Four days later, as I was standing there in that same entryway, they told me, David, we believe what we experienced on that day when we prayed over this place was a spiritual transfer of ownership. And I really believe that is exactly what they experienced there at 72 Ransom Street. Today that ministry is thriving. Today that ministry is helping to plant pregnancy centers that are saving lives all around the world. But they had a spiritual transfer of ownership. For me, that was a wake-up call to start thinking about the crisis that we are in here in America. Because when you think about it, America started out as one nation under God, right? That was our foundation. That was our heritage. And in fact, when our founding fathers drafted the Declaration of Independence, do you remember the very first fundamental right that they identified? It was the right to life. Now, it wasn't a right that they gave us. It was a right they recognized comes from our creator, an inalienable right. But from that beginning of virtue, from that beginning of faith, we look at how far America has fallen. Today we recognize that we are in the midst of a crisis because not only have we drifted away from our Judeo-Christian heritage, we have also rejected that foundational right to life. We are in the midst of the greatest crisis this nation has ever faced right now, right here. Since the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision in 1973 when seven men imposed abortion on all of America, since that time, more than 52 million innocent children have perished from abortion. Millions of women have been wounded. Men have been shoved to the sidelines and they're told, you don't have any say in this. You're just a man. It's not your body and it's not your choice. And yet every child I've ever met had both a mother and a what? A father. We see families torn apart. We see abortion affecting us right here locally. I pulled up the numbers last night. They were just recently released for last year in Virginia. 26,356 abortions were performed in our commonwealth last year. And of those, 807 came from Spotsylvania, Stafford, or Fredericksburg. 807. That means that every single day, at least two more children are dying right here in our backyard. At least two more women are being wounded. We see organizations like Planned Parenthood. Mr. Zimkoviak mentioned Planned Parenthood, the largest abortion chain in our nation. Last year, according to the Associated Press, 322 of their facilities did abortions, either surgical or chemical abortions. And according to their own annual reports, they terminated 324,000 children at their facilities, all the while taking in a record $349.6 million of taxpayer money. If you have a part-time job and you pay taxes or your parents pay taxes, which I know they do, some of that money is going to fund an organization that is destroying our future. And if that wasn't enough, Planned Parenthood got some of their closest friends elected to the highest offices in our land. And last summer, they rammed through an abortion mandate in the health care reform bill that requires coverage of, of abortion on our insurance plans and will require over these next three years full taxpayer funding of abortion. That's the crisis that we are facing. That is how far we have fallen from that foundation of a nation under God, that foundation of the right to life. We are in a situation where a nation that was a place of life and honoring God has become a place of death, a place that rejects God. In America, we desperately need a spiritual transfer of ownership, just like what happened at 72 Ransom Street. The beautiful news is, the hope is that God has given us a clear prescription for, to remedy what it is that ails our nation. And I think it's best articulated in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And that verse says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. 
think that verse through. Just let me dissect that just for a minute because I think it's very instructive to all of us. If my people who are called by my name, who do you think God's talking to in that verse there? Us, right? We are his people. We are called by his name as Christians. We bear his name. We are children of God, of Christ, God in human form, one of the three of the Holy Trinity. We are his people called by his name. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Now, sometimes in America, we're very prideful. We're very rugged in our individualism. But God is telling us we need to humble ourselves. And to be honest, what I think he's trying to tell us there is we need to realize we are not the solution to this crisis of abortion. If we think that we can end this through the laws that we pass, through the judges we put into certain courts, through the lobbying groups that we have, through the money that we put into pro-life work, if we think we can end it exclusively through institutions of man or people or our power or our politics or our influence, if we think that's the whole solution, we're kidding ourselves. We need to humble ourselves and realize we are not the answer, but God tells us in the next part of that verse what the answer is. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. God is telling us we don't need to put all the burden of responsibility on ourselves. If we pray and we seek his face, he will intercede. Now here's the hardest part. The next part of that verse is the hardest part for all of us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, here it is, and turn from their wicked ways. Now it's easy. We're in high school. We're thinking about, hey, you know, abortion's really wicked. Children dying, that's really wicked. Our culture, there's a lot of things really wicked. But hey, I'm here in my nice little bubble of this wonderful Catholic high school. It's a culture of life campus. But I think God is speaking to each of us in that verse. Because all of us are sinners. And he's telling us if we turn away from our wicked ways. That includes the sinful things we have all done. But I also think he's telling us to turn away from the passive inaction. The things we haven't done. The sins of omission. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Here comes the most important word in that entire verse. Then. Then. God says, if we do those things, then he will hear our prayer, forgive our sin, and heal our land. He's given us a prescription right there, and our land is in desperate need of healing. Now, I shared the last time I was here at St. Michael's a little bit of the story of 40 Days for Life and the power I've seen of what happens when God's people follow that prescription. But I wanted to give you a little bit more of the rest of the story and a few other stories that will help you to understand just how profound that little verse can be when it's lived out in our world. I shared with you last time I was here about an hour of prayer that launched what is today 40 Days for Life. But what I didn't share is something that happened the night before that hour of prayer in the late summer of 2004. My wife and I headed up marriage preparation programs in our deanery in Texas there. And so we had a pre-Cana workshop that we put on for about 30 engaged couples. And we had several married couples that helped. And then we always did a follow-up dinner with the married couples to say, how can we keep improving upon this program? So we had that follow-up dinner that night at our house. And there were several couples there. One of them was a couple named the Arabies. The husband's name was David. And right before dinner, we were talking about anything and everything, and David was sharing his frustration that in our community, the abortion facility there had just hit 2,000 abortions it had performed since opening in 1999. And he said, how can we let this keep happening? Why are we not doing more about this? And then he shared something. His father had been a union organizer years earlier, and they used to, when they would picket to try to get higher paychecks, they would do these 24-hour-a-day pickets outside of their workplaces to draw attention to the crisis of the unfair pay or unfair working conditions. And he said, why aren't we willing to do that much when lives are being lost here? What if we were out there 24 hours a day? What would the community think? I started thinking, you're crazy, but boy, that would be really getting the attention of the community. But that night when I went to bed, that was weighing on my mind, weighing on my heart. And the next day, when I went to our little pro-life group's office, we decided that we needed to pray because in that town, we had seen the body of Christ largely fall asleep at the wheel. Pap pulpits had fallen silent on the topic of abortion. We saw the media have a very pro-abortion bias. We saw people just initially surge into trying to stop abortion, but over time, they just kind of drifted away. And the pro-life movement had almost completely dwindled out in that town. And so we decided for one hour to pray and ask God to show us what to do next, in part prompted by the frustration that David Araby had shared with me the night before. 
So we prayed fervently and we took that advice of 2 Chronicles 7, 14. We recognized that we were his people. We were called by his name. We needed to humble ourselves and say, we obviously haven't figured it out yet. And so we need to pray and see God's face, turn from our wicked ways, and we need to ask God to come in and heal our land and forgive our sin. During that hour of prayer, the first thing that God convicted us about was the time frame of 40 days. When we read throughout biblical history, isn't that a time frame that keeps showing up over and over again? Noah was on the ark for 40 days. Moses on Mount Sinai for 40 days. Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. Over and over again, God uses that time frame to bring about transformation. When we look at our world today, how many of us would agree we need some transformation in America? Amen? So why not align ourselves with that 40-day time frame? The three things we felt led to do, number one, was to pray and fast for an end to abortion for 40 days and call upon our community to pray and fast. Now, two of the people at the table there literally went on a bread and water fast. I was not one of those people. I had never fasted in my life before that. My Protestant upbringing, we had never emphasized fasting. I married Margaret, my Catholic wife. Every Lent, she would share with me about fasting. But as we sat there, we thought about the scripture that says there are some demons that can only be driven out through prayer and fasting. And we thought maybe this is something we've been missing. We decided to pray and fast. We decided to secondly hold a 24 hour a day, 40 day long vigil outside of the Planned Parenthood, taking the advice that David Araby had shed the night before and putting it into action for a 40 day time frame. We knew that our presence there would not only prick the conscience of the community, but it would be a witness to those mothers going in at that last second and maybe offer them hope and maybe offer them an alternative where they would choose life. And we've seen that happen time and time again. The third and final thing that we felt led to do was to hold grassroots community outreach, where literally, as I mentioned, a team of college students went door to door to every household in our community, over 25,000 homes, inviting people to come out and pray and fast and be a part of the solution to the crisis of abortion. We finished that hour of prayer. And as we sat there, we had it written on a piece of paper, we were really scared. We had never done anything like this before, and we didn't know if we could pull it off. And right then, we had a decision to make, and that decision is no different than the decision that you as young adults have to make. Will we answer God's call, or will we ignore it and pretend we didn't hear it, while more women continue to be wounded, while more children continue to die? We realized we didn't really have a choice. And so we decided three weeks from that day to kick off the first ever 40 Days for Life campaign. And during those 40 days, over 1,000 people got involved in that local campaign, and abortions were slashed by 28%, sparing over 100 lives in that little town. During that campaign, one of the things that amazed us was the commitment of that young man, David Araby, that I mentioned to you. David was a college student, and David, the one who had shared the idea of the 24-hour-a-day vigil, when we went back to him and said, you know what you suggested? We're doing it. I thought, let's see if he's really going to put his faith into action, if he's going to really live out what he just suggested to us. David committed at the beginning of 40 days to be out there eight hours every single night for 40 days. So from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. for 40 days, David was out there. And he was recruiting. He was a knight of Columbus. So he recruited his fellow knights out there. They called it the night shift with a K. And it was just amazing to see the passion and the drive of David Araby. It was incredible. But when we finished that campaign, what we didn't know is that it would spread beyond the borders of that little town. We were exhausted, never wanted to do it again because we were so wiped out. But one by one, other cities began to duplicate that 40 Days for Life model. And over time, we came to realize in 2007 that God was calling us to organize national and then eventually international campaigns. We just finished another 40 Days for Life campaign on October 31st. We've had one since I was last with you here in April. Cumulatively, since 40 Days for Life began, we have now seen 1,085 campaigns conducted in 337 different cities across all 50 American states and five other countries. We've seen collectively more than 400,000 people who have participated in 40 Days for Life campaigns to date from over 13,000 church congregations. And as of the end of this campaign, the tallied number of confirmed lives saved, and I'm sure there are many more we don't know about, was 3,599. 3,599 babies who were scheduled for abortion, whose mothers changed their mind and chose life, who are alive today because God's people were willing to humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways and put that faith into action. 
We've now seen up to this point eight abortion facilities close their doors and go out of business for good. I didn't know when I was here the last time we would see two more abortion facilities close since I was last with you. One in Raleigh, North Carolina. The other one was on day two of this past fall's 40 Days for Life campaign just up the road in Severna Park, Maryland. In Severna Park, this was their third 40 Days for Life campaign focused on this abortion facility called Gynecare. And when they started the campaign, on day one, they felt led to pray very specifically and very fervently that God would close that place down the next day. And little did they know the next morning when they woke up, they would find out it was out of business after 20 years in operation. Little things can make a profound difference if we have faith the size of a mustard seed. We're told it can move mountains, right? They had faith that place would close, and on day two, it did. One of the other things we never expected was the number of abortion workers who would have conversions, who would leave their jobs. The last time I was here, I shared the story of Abby Johnson, and Abby was the director of the Planned Parenthood in Bryan College Station, Texas, where 40 Days for Life began. She ran the abortion facility outside of which 40 Days for Life started. And last fall, during the 40 Days for Life, she witnessed an abortion on an ultrasound for the very first time. She saw a 13-week-old baby fight for its life, and then on that TV screen, she saw that baby lose its fight for life. And she was convicted that she could never do this again, that she could never participate in this, that she had lived eight years of a lie at Planned Parenthood. But what I didn't share with you when I was here in April was one of the key factors that led Abby to not just quit her job, but to join the pro-life movement where now her story has been heard by millions of people as she goes around the country encouraging other people to do everything they can to close down Planned Parenthood facilities and to end abortion. The one factor that was pivotal for her was a young lady named Elizabeth. Elizabeth was a college student. When Elizabeth came to Texas A&M, she felt led to become a sidewalk counselor, offering hope and help to women going in for abortions. She was very good at it. But one of the things that Elizabeth started to feel very convicted about is that she needed to pray for the workers at the abortion facility and specifically for the director of that clinic, Abby. So Elizabeth began to be friendly, to be loving, to be charitable towards Abby. And every day when Abby would pull in, she would say, good morning, Abby, I'm praying for you. Day after day, that went on. One day, Abby pulled into her workplace, got out of her car, and there was Elizabeth smiling at the gate, holding a bouquet of flowers. And Abby looked and she said, what are those for? And Elizabeth said, I brought them for you just to tell you that I love you and I'm praying for you. Well, Abby refused to take him. She ran into the clinic. But the whole time she was in there, she kept peeking out the window. And there was Elizabeth smiling, holding the flowers. Finally, Elizabeth needed to leave. She laid the flowers down. They had a little note on them with a psalm and a little note saying, I'm praying for you, Abby. She laid them down on the edge of the driveway and she left to go off to class. Abby saw that Elizabeth was gone. She ran outside and grabbed the flowers and brought them into her office. She took that little note, she read it, and it really started to speak to her, and she put that note down in her desk. The flowers eventually died and got thrown away. But that day, when Abby witnessed that abortion, she was going into her office going, I have to leave this place. She started to clean out her desk. She opened her drawer, and there staring at her was that note from Elizabeth, somebody who had loved her even though she was doing something so horrifically bad. That note spoke to her and she said, I need to join these people, not just quit my job. A college student God used to bring about a conversion that now has reached many, many millions of people and I believe will continue to shape our world. Now the one story I wanted to kind of use to kind of tie all this up and put a bow on it was the rest of the story of David Araby. I share with you at the beginning how he had been the one who suggested the idea of the 24 hour a day vigil at our house that night and how he had been out there eight hours a day. When we left and moved from Bryan College Station in 2005 up here to Virginia, I hadn't heard from David in a couple of years. When we finished the first fall 40 Days for Life in 2007, I got an email, though, from David. And he said, boy, was I excited to see what God did through this 40 Days for Life all across America and a few other countries. He said, who would have ever thought that this little seed of faith in Bryan College Station would spread all over the place? And then he said in the email, David, I never share with you why I was so passionate, why I was out there eight hours a night, why I suggested that 24-hour-a-day vigil, but I felt like I needed to tell you. He said, months before we ever did that first 40 Days for Life, I got noticed that my dad was dying of cancer. And my dad had always been my hero. And I felt that what I needed to do was go in the last few weeks of his life, just be there at his side by his deathbed, just with him, showing him I loved him. He said, the first day I went, my dad said, David, so glad you're here. Can we pray a rosary together for an end to abortion? David said, sure. So they prayed a rosary. 
The next day he came back. His dad said, David, can we pray a rosary for the end of abortion? Okay. They prayed a rosary together. The next day and the next day, some days two and three rosaries, specifically with the intention of an end to abortion. Finally, one day, David said to his dad, Dad, can we pray for something else today? Can we pray for your healing? Can we pray for an ease of your pain? Anything else? And his dad said, no, we are going to pray today for an end to abortion. And then he told David why. Not many years earlier, he had found out that his girlfriend was in a crisis pregnancy due to him. And in that situation, he knew, oh, I've got to just get rid of the problem. That's what he thought. So he pressured her into scheduling an appointment for an abortion. And he pulled the money together, paid the abortionist, and went down that morning to meet her at the abortion facility for her scheduled appointment, and she stood him up. He said, I was so mad at that girl for so long, but finally she gave birth to the baby, and eventually my family pressured me into marrying her. He said, David, that young woman was your mother. You were the baby that I tried to pay to have aborted. He said, little did I know when I put up the cash to kill my own child, when that failed to happen, that would be the one person who would be standing at my side by my deathbed. After sharing that story, a few days later, David's father passed away and went to his heavenly rest. David had a passion. He had a burn because he took it personally. He realized it's not just an issue. It's not just a topic. This is personal. This is life and death, good and evil, heaven and hell. And David poured himself into that 40 days. He shared with us the ideas that are the public cornerstone of what is now spread to over 337 cities around the globe. Look at what God can do when one person humbles themselves, prays, seeks his face, turns from their wicked ways. God can move mountains. It's not easy to do this work. And I know for some of you, you're going, okay, I'm a student, I'm busy, I'm doing all kinds of other things, but there are ways that you can help to change history through your time here at St. Michael. Maybe it's to pray more than we've ever prayed. Maybe it's to fast. Maybe it's to participate in the next 40 Days for Life campaign during the Lenten season. Maybe it's to be a part of educating yourself on these issues through classes, through speakers, things like we're doing right now. Maybe it's to help shape this in your, in your high school campus so that you can make sure that this is a thriving culture of life that is a beacon of light, not only to the rest of this community, but to other high schools around the country. Maybe it's to find a friend who's in a time of need, who's in a crisis pregnancy, and letting them know about local centers here that can help them. Maybe it's to volunteer at Mary's Shelter here locally. Maybe it's to get involved in the Paul Stephan home. Maybe it's for you to speak out on these issues to your friends and in other places in public. Maybe it's to go to the March for Life in January and be there with three, 400,000 other people, most of whom are your age, not my age, who are there passionate about bringing an end to this crisis in our nation. Maybe it's to encourage your family to get more involved, to financially support local pro-life ministries, to make sure we always vote pro-life when you are of age and able to start voting. Whatever it is, I know it's going to be hard, but it will be worth it. And I will close with one final story to show of the many thousands that I've been blessed to see how incredibly worth it it is. There was a lady named Joanne who signed up to do a 40 Days for Life in Providence, Rhode Island. Her daughter, Eleanor, agreed to help her with it. And when they signed up, they thought, this is going to be so exciting. They ran to their local priest, and they said, we want to do a 40 Days for Life. Here's what it's all about. Can we get our congregation involved? And the priest said, I, I'm sorry, we can't do that. That's too political. So they thought, oh, okay. So they ran to the local political groups. They told them all about 40 Days for Life, and the political group said, I'm sorry, we can't do that. That's too religious. Everybody was telling them no. Friends, family, anybody they invited, it just seemed like hardly anybody wanted to be a part. Literally, just a small handful of people joined them in their 40 Days for Life, their first campaign. And so most hours of their 40-day vigil outside of the local Planned Parenthood, it was either Joanne or Eleanor or the two of them out there. It was hard. My family's been on the road. We homeschool right now, Claire and Patrick, and so we've been traveling all over the country. My kids have been to 40 states for Patrick and 39 for Claire, and Rhode Island is one of those states. We went during that campaign, and we went out to pray with Joanne and Eleanor, and it was just the two of them when we were out there. And they shared with us how the workers coming into the abortion facility would spit on them and curse them. People driving by would give them obscene gestures. They talked about how hard it was, and I said, but have you seen any results? Have you seen any fruit? And they said, really, no, no, we haven't. But Mother Teresa told us, we're not called to be successful, we're called to be faithful. So we're going to continue to do this. Well, they kept going, and by the end of that campaign, I called Joanne and Eleanor, and I said, did you ever see any results? Did you ever have any breakthroughs? 
And they said, no, not really. But we really were blessed. We had a great experience. It helped us to grow closer to our Lord. But inside, my heart just broke a little bit because I knew how much these women had poured out their hearts into this effort many times by themselves. And I just had hoped that God would just give them a little glimpse that their efforts had paid off. But a few months later, they finally did get that glimpse. They called me and said, you're never going to believe what just happened. A local priest, a different one, called them and said, a young couple came to me. They're about to give birth to a little baby boy, and they've asked me to baptize him. And they shared with this priest that they had gone to that Planned Parenthood abortion facility during that 40-day time frame for an abortion. They had walked right past Joanne and Eleanor going in for their scheduled abortion. And as they sat in the waiting room determined they had to get rid of this problem, it suddenly hit them. Those two ladies outside are praying for us right now. And Joanne and uh, the, the couple inside just put their pencil down. They ran out, went right past Joanne and Eleanor, never told them what they had decided, but they changed their mind and chose life. This priest said to them, you didn't even know this, that they chose life, but they just sent me a picture, and I'm going to email it to you, of the 4D ultrasound of their little baby boy. They've named him Robert. And when you look at this picture, he is perfect. He's made in God's image and likeness. He's about to be born. He's healthy. He's happy. And he is alive because of you. When they sent that picture to Margaret and myself, we just wept because we looked at this beautiful little boy that almost became an abortion statistic and realized if it wasn't for the faith of a mother and her young daughter, little Robert would not be alive today. If you've not yet had that experience of seeing a life that is saved due to your faithfulness and pro-life work, I pray that one day you will have that experience because that is when you will know it's worth it. And one day in America, we will see this crisis of abortion end. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but we know with God all things are possible. And when abortion ends, our grandchildren, our children are going to be coming to all of us and saying, you were there at the beginning of the end of abortion. What happened? And you're going to talk about how God's people were willing to recognize they were called by his name to humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways. And as a result of that, God heard their prayer, was willing to forgive our sin of our land, and he was willing to heal America. And when you share that with your children, they're going to be so inspired and your grandchildren will be so inspired because they'll say, you know what, while everybody else in Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania County and Stafford County were busy doing their thing, you were doing the right thing. As a high school student, when you went off to college, as a young adult, you were doing the right thing. And the good news is because we continue to press on in faith, God will not only save lives, change hearts and minds, and impact eternal souls, but people will look as this world is transformed, as abortion ends, they're going to look and say, it's certainly not because of all of us. They're going to say it could only be because of God Almighty. And I believe that through these efforts, God is going to bring about revival like we have never seen in our lifetimes. And I believe that America, a nation that was founded under God, that has drifted so far away, I believe that what we are going to witness in these coming years is a spiritual transfer of ownership as this nation is once again reclaimed for God and becomes a nation under God. When that happens, we can have confidence in knowing that when eventually we pass from this world, when we meet our maker, we will hear those beautiful words, well done, good and faithful servant.